all friends of the IDF, I am honored today to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker, Brigadier General Nitsan Nouriel. General Nouriel is currently an associate at the International Institute for Counterterrorism, the ICT, in Herzliya, and is the former director of the Counterterrorism Bureau at the Prime Minister's Office. With a distinguished military career, Brigadier General Nouriel served in commanding roles, including Deputy Division Commander and Territorial Brigade Commander in Judea and Samaria. He was a military attache in Washington, D.C., where he fostered collaboration between the IDF and U.S. military entities and received the Legion of Merit Award from the U.S. President for his exceptional service. In 2015, he also received an Excellence Award from the U.S. Congress for his enduring battle against terror. On October 7th and 8th, he fought in the Metiv Ashra area, and since the ground maneuver, he's escorted IDF troops all over Gaza as the deputy commander of the Israeli Special Forces. His extensive experience and unwavering commitment make Brigadier General Nouriel a respected authority in counterterrorism and crisis management. Today, he'll give us an operational analysis about the current situation and will help to clear up questions perhaps you've had yourself. So without further ado, please welcome Brigadier General Nitsan Nouriel. Good evening, everybody from Israel. In Israel, it's almost, uh, not almost, it's 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, and I wish you all a great day in front of you. Uh, the overall situation right now is very complicated. I'll try to make it simple, uh, build up cubes so you have the ability to understand which stage we are and what do we have in front of us. Let me start with Gaza Street. In Gaza, we have, generally speaking, four major missions in front of us. The first one is, is Rafa. I'll speak about it in a minute. The second one is uh, the hostages. The third one is the question, who is going to monitor and control the area of Gaza the day after? It is mostly political question, but very much affect the IDF uh, actions on the ground. And last but not least, how to, how to rebuild the trust between the citizens around Gaza Strip with the military forces, because by October 7th, those type of relationship, in a way, had been broken, and we need to build them back. So let's start with Rafa. Uh, the overall situation in Rafa is that during the operation in Gaza, in order to prevent casualties from the civilian side, we back them almost for three weeks, to move down to the southern part of Gaza Street, meaning to the area of Rafa. And they did it because of few reasons. A, we forced them. B, they could get food, water, and health care. And three, they had a dream that the Egyptian will open the gate and let them escape into Sinai. We know that the Egyptian role is that whatsoever we will not support the Palestinians, whatsoever we will not rescue them. It is not our problem. This is the Israeli and the Palestinian leaders' problem. This is the Egyptian statement since 78. It's not something new. So right now around Rafa, there are 1.3 million refugees. You cannot maneuver aggressively in order to defeat the fourth Hamas battalion that still remained then there without evacuate those citizens. So the first stage is to find a way how to convince those people to move into the shoreline. By that, they will be able to get more support from the sea, be in kind of a, a shelter, a secure zone, get food, get water, get Wi-Fi, get electricity, get uh, um, uh, medical treatment. And by that, they will be more secure than if they stay around Rafa. The second stage will be go in in order to destroy the last four Hamas battalion. Hamas used to have 22 battalion. 
18 already destroyed by us and uh, four battalion that still exist, we believe that we need to destroy them in order to make sure that Hamas, from the military point of view, will not be able to be again in the situation we were uh, before October 7th. And last but not least is how can we do all those tasks and at the same time to rescue our hostages? Those are the missions we have. The timeline, without uh, being too much specific, to maneuver the civilians from Rafa will take us a few weeks to fight in Gaza, in Rafa, another two weeks. So all in all, we have something like two more months before we can declare that Hamas as a military player is not longer uh, threatening the state of Israel. I need to say something about the hostages. Uh, again, very complicated. We know that the order Hamas gave his own people, in case of they see the IDF coming close to the hostages, they have to kill them. So the dilemma we have is how can we maneuver above the ground and under the ground without risk our hostages? And I can tell you, as someone who uh, visited most of those tunnels, you cannot fight in gentle way in those tunnels. It's very deep, some places 80 meters, uh, very tough to breathe, many booby traps, and you don't want to damage our hostages. So we need to find different methods and different techniques how to uh, fight there in order to defeat Hamas and at the same time to rescue our hostages. So this is number one. Number two, uh, the area of Khan Yunus, which is right now the major combat area for us. The 98th Division uh, still work there. Uh, we know that there are some hostages in this area. We know that some Hamas leaders are there. And I believe that we have something like two more weeks before we can say Khan Yunus is over. And yet, like we did in Gaza Strip, in the city of Gaza, uh, based on very good intelligence, in case we get it, mostly from those terrorists who are uh, surrounded and, and uh, give up, uh, based on that intelligence, we probably may go again into those sites in order to uh, complete uh, places which we either miss or they rebuild because this is the nature of a uh, uh, terror organization trying to rebuild himself all the time. Uh, the third point, who is going to control Gaza Strip? It's a pure political decision. I'm not going to touch it. All I'm saying is that without a clear answer and a fast, a fat answer, a first and fast answer, uh, it will be very tough for us to be prepared for any political decision. Just to make it clear, the military believe that it's not a good idea that the IDF will control Gaza Strip for the next few years. We did it in the past. It's very complicated. It's created a lot of friction. Create above the Israelis. It is refreshing the memories of the days we were sitting in Lebanon, more than 18 years, with a feeling that maybe it's not a good idea, but nobody has the courage to take out to take us out of Lebanon. Just for proportion, I entered Lebanon as a company commander in 82 and left Lebanon as the J3 of the Northern Command in May 2000. And most of the Israelis do not want to be in the same story again. But again, this is a political decision. Regarding the Israelis who used to live around Gaza, I believe that many of them will come and live again around Gaza. 
And we have a mission to build up the trust. We have a mission uh, to convince them that yes, we made a mistake during October 7th. Uh, we are not proud of it. We know that we fail. And yet we have a lot, a lot, a lot to provide them in order to provide security and safety because they deserve it. Having said that, at the same time, up in the north, uh, we have our uh, own problems. Just for uh, your knowledge, the overall situation up in the north is worse than in the south. More people evacuated from their houses. The damage along the borderline is dramatic. Take Kibbutz Manar as an example. 152 houses from Kibbutz Manara are not longer relevant for people use, meaning we will need to rebuild Kibbutz Manara. It will take two years at least. The people along the borderline already know that they will not be able to come back before the fall. So, now, so if I am putting everything on timeline, we have few weeks dealing with Gaza and then prepare ourselves to deal with, with Hezbollah. I unfortunately cannot believe that Hezbollah will compromise and accept international agreement. And most of the Israelis cannot relay on international committees and commitments. So whatsoever we need to launch ground maneuver in order to push Hezbollah away from the Israeli border. Is this achievable? The answer is yes. What will be the results? What will be the outcome? Outcome? The Israeli home front home front will suffer from thousands of rockets. I believe that the damage will be equivalent, so many collapse sites, and yet we understand that we need to find the mechanism how to push Hezbollah far from the border. I can share with you that many of them already left the borderline, but it's not enough. Without destroying the infrastructure without some international agreements, they may be back soon, and this is not good for us. At the same time, the Iranian Shiite militias in Syria are prepared themselves to participate into the war. Some of them already in Lebanon, about support Hezbollah, another Part of them are prepare themselves to open another front up in the Golan against us. So, if I can add all the fronts we are dealing with, is Gaza Strip, Lebanon, Syria, lately Iraq become part of it. The Houthis for a few months are bothering us. And there is only one player that do not use his own soil in order to attack us. And those are the Iranians. And for a moment, I will enter into the Iranian shoes and try to share with you the Iranian dilemma. For 40 years, Iran invest in order to establish Hezbollah. Hezbollah was established mainly to control Lebanon and to be uh, the proxies, the main proxy that will attack Israel in case of any clash between us and Iran. And the Iranian dilemma is the following. Are we going to lose Hezbollah because of Hamas? Are we going to lose or are we going to sacrifice the Shiites fighter for the Sunnis? This is, those are very big issues. And at that stage, the Iranian are reconsider what should be the next step. 
if I can add into it all the Israeli attacks against the Iranian targets in Syria, is about to show them that there is a price for their policies, including the high rank officers, including all the convoy and all the storages. It's too soon to say what will be the Iranian response, but they are in a very deep dilemma. They don't want to lose Hezbollah, but they know for sure if they keep doing what they're doing, the Israeli ground maneuver will create a lot of damage to Hezbollah. To summarize it, before I uh, let you ask questions, I didn't say nothing about Judah and Samaria in the Ramadan month. Almost every day we do have a terror event inside Israel with casualties. I didn't say nothing about the problem we have inside the Israeli society. And we start seeing the riots and, and demonstrations mainly because of two reasons, uh, the hostages on one hand, and uh, in a way, bad feeling we have regarding the government decisions, including the fact that next week they are going to take 58 of vacation day from parliament walking. And this is something that drives the Israelis crazy. How they are going to solve it? This is a political issue much above me. I cannot really influence it. So all in all, I belong to those who believe that the worst is ahead of us, not behind us. October 7th was a dramatic event, very painful, but it's too soon to say how it's going to affect our life in the long term. All the other issues that I've just uh, mentioned, if we don't solve them soon, they will affect our life dramatically. So what can I ask from you? Keep doing what you do. Support us and make sure that uh, the people who live in America understand the picture. Because sometimes we have the feeling that they do not really understand the picture. They forgot October 7th. They forgot all the uh cases which i saw by myself and and it is something that you cannot accept whatsoever if you have any questions please do wow um thank you so so much general noriel you know everything that you shared so much of it was very hard to hear but i really think that it's important that our audience Here's the truth, and that we get to hear from people like yourself who have the expertise, who have a sense of history, who were there in the tunnels, who understand what our soldiers are up against currently and what they're up against in the long term. So we really appreciate your not sugarcoating it for us. Um, necessarily, you had to simplify it because it is just so complex, but you gave us a tremendous picture of of all of the factors at play and we're, we're so, so grateful. I have a follow-up questions on a, in a few different areas. If we go back to Gaza for a second, um, can you share with us, given all of the complexities that you shared, the number of civilians, the need to you know, evacuate them in some way in order to maneuver, how is the IDF going to do that? And will the port that the US built off the coast of Gaza help in that effort? Um, and even, even aside from that how, has that, how has that port affected the IDF's ability to maneuver or improved their, you know, their abilities um, in Gaza? Just to make it clear, it's not a port, it's a pier. And the concept is to uh, reload everything in Cyprus, fully checked by us, to make sure that nobody is uh, cheating us as they did in the past, and then shift it into that pier. Uh, some NGOs uh, will take care of it and spread it into the people. We are very much worried 
uh, to make sure that Hamas is not taking uh, this area and not taking those goods in order to make sure that he will have enough and the people will stay suffer. So all the actions from the sea are fully coordinated with us. Um, we are very happy that they are happened. And we are looking forward to see the results of all those humanitarian efforts. Unfortunately, two days ago, we made a mistake. And by mistake, we killed seven uh, workers, seven civilians uh, that came to work and help. Uh, we apologize. Uh, but I can share with you another figure. 17 percent, one seven percent from the Israeli overall casualties during that war came from friendly fire. Meaning shit happens. Meaning during a war when it's very complicated, very dense, very everything, people make mistakes. And those mistakes create casualties. We don't like it, we don't love it, but this is the reality when you are fighting. That's the way war looks like. How to evacuate the civilians from the area of uh, Rafa? If you provide them food, water, healthcare, Wi Fi, electricity, and you promise them that Hamas will not attack them there, because Hamas attacked his own people all the time, they will move into safe area. I'm very much concerned that Hamas will try to prevent it. How do they do it? They open fire, as simple as it is. So we have to make sure that we are fully prepared to make sure that Hamas cannot open fire against them. So at the same time, we need to deal with uh, refugees, with Hamas, and with hostages issue. Therefore, it's very complicated. For sure. Actually, I wanted to ask you a question about the the Gazan civilian response because since the we, reports have been coming out about Iranians celebrating the elimination of um, of some of the high ranking um, Iranian generals and even Gazans understanding that Hamas is the enemy and you know, and and cursing Sinwar and Hamas. Um, and I guess my question is, how do we square that with other polls that show that the majority of Gazans, like upwards of 70 percent majority, celebrated October 7th um, and that they were in support of the attacks? So do, does the civilian population there at the end of the day, are they secretly rooting for the IDF? Or are they rooting for Hamas because they support their terrorist, you know, atrocities? No simple answers. If you uh, analyze what happened in Gaza Strip since 2007, when Hamas took over, you can see the following. This is a new generation that actually grew up under the Hamas regime. The definition of generation is the gap between the father and the kid. And they have many, many, many small kids. So it's not 25 years, it's sometimes less than 20 years. 20 years, uh, which Hamas controlled Gaza, raised a generation that by heart hate us, by heart believe that Israel has no right to exist. Therefore, they can loot rape, murder, and do things that are not acceptable. It will take time, and therefore you need to provide them an alternative. If they don't know who is about to take the responsibility on the area of Gaza, they will keep, in a way, support Hamas, because they're afraid of them. If by the end of that process, Hamas will be again the one who controls Gaza, the people of Gaza will support him. This is the combination between the political decisions and the military actions. 
So I cannot say at that stage, do the people of Gaza study the lessons? The answer is probably not yet. Not yet. And basically, they are always blaming us. So they probably, in the short term, will keep blaming us unless somebody else will come, control this area, and start a process, process to recover the Gaza Strip area and make Gaza Strip, as Abu Abbas said, almost 20 years ago, that Gaza Strip can be the Singapore of the Middle East. And I pray for them that that will be the point. So uh, a question about that. The, the Gazans who, they support Hamas because they fear Hamas. So I can understand that. But the defense minister, Yoav Gallant, just yesterday shared um, that Hamas is disintegrating from within. And that's according to the Hamas terrorists who have been arrested themselves. So can you explain to us what that means and what it means for the Gazans who see that that leadership that they thought was so strong and so powerful and so invincible to see it falling apart? If that, how, how does that affect that faith in them that they are so powerful and that they have to subscribe to what they're preaching and what they're doing? There are two different sides to the same coin. The people of Gaza already study that in case of a military clash, all the leaders are going deep in the ground to defend themselves and they don't care about the people. It's become well known in Gaza. It's not something new. All the commanders, I can tell you up the level of battalion commander, they are going under the ground and hide uh, try to monitor the combat situation. Many times they cannot, but this is well known in Gaza. The second element, which is a bit more important, is the following. The people who lives in Gaza sees the Hamas fighter are giving up. That has a lot, a lot, a lot to the overall atmosphere because the numbers are growing. So far, we have more than 2,000 Hamas fighters that already gave up. A, they provide us a lot of information, a lot of intelligence, which we use in order to be more effective. And secondly, the people understand that maybe, it's too soon to say, maybe the Hamas regime period is over. But as long as Rafa exists, they still afraid. The, this is the importance of taking Rafa. Make sure that the people of Gaza understand that Hamas probably will not be able to come and take over Gaza and threaten them again. Mm. So one thing that we've learned in these briefings is that even the surrenders could even be a strategy of Hamas to keep their people alive, at least alive, so that when they're ultimately released, they rejoin Hamas, and now Hamas has fighters. Um, that's something that if we're having that conversation here, do you feel like the locals are having the same conversation and that it's uh, enabling them to sort of hang on to this fear or hope, depending on the persuasion, that, that Hamas will, is here to stay? you draw a scenario that can be an option. And yet, according to the international law and according to the Israeli values, you cannot kill someone that raises his hand. This is very clear. Uh, what will be the future of those prisoners in Israel? It's too soon to say. All I can say at that stage is that we took a decision, a dramatic decision, as we did back then in Munich 72, after the Olympic tragedy. All those that participate into October 7th attack, they will die sooner or later. How long it took us then? 20 years. I believe that in that story, it will take us even less. 
But this is uh, a dramatic decision by the Israeli government. And actually, we work in order to achieve it. And we will achieve it. Those who penetrate the borderline and did what they did, they will pay the ultimate price. Thank you. Um, from there, I'd love for us to now shift to the north. Um, you know, one question that I'm sure a lot of our viewers have is, and it's really a fear. Uh, I'm asking if it's if it's a founded fear or not. But we have seen a lot of activity coming from the north, coming from Hezbollah in Lebanon, sometimes 30, 40 missiles at a time shot into Israel. And there's a fear. Is the strategy there that they want Israel to use up its defensive supply so that, you know, once the supply is down, then they can come in and attack and the country won't be able to handle the, the onslaught? What is the, is that a legitimate fear or is Israel, or is it not? Let's make it clear. Hezbollah fire capabilities are 100 times stronger than Hamas. Part of the actions along the borderline, they actually try to test the Israeli system. The size of the salvos, the tempo of the salvos, and also some of the targets. It's only the beginning of the movie. In the real clash between us and Hezbollah, it will be much, much, much stronger. So what are the alternatives? We cannot pull back. We have right. to and therefore, uh, if we cannot reach international agreement, that Hezbollah will be pushed behind the Litani River, that the official Lebanese military forces will enter the area and reinforce everything needed, the Israeli ground maneuver hopefully will solve that issue. And yet the price is going to be very high. Understood. In light of what you were referencing earlier uh, in terms of the Iranian commanders that have been neutralized in Syria and even uh, in Iran a few days ago, what do you foresee as the implications of that? I, one of the things that we always need to remind ourselves as Americans is just that the people that we're talking about don't share Western values. They don't share the Western culture. They have a culture that's based on respect and honor and, and fear and a need to assert themselves again, not to be not to be shown as weak or that Israel got to them. So recognizing all of that, what do you what do you think is ahead um, as as Iran, which, as you said, hasn't used their own uh, their own land as a as a battleground or a launching pad yet? Thank God. Um, what do you see as a consequence? Iran always prefer to use proxies. They don't want to fight by themselves. So I believe that in the next few weeks, they will keep using proxies in order to punish us, in order to uh, show us that they are not uh, giving up. Having said that, if you take all the uh, strikes, from us, from the United States, from others against Iranian targets around all the Middle East, their response was not so sharp, was not so hard. And the questions are, what are they waiting for? I believe, I don't know enough, but I believe that they will keep try using proxies. They will keep threaten all the players, including you, including the British, including us. But on the bottom line, they will try very hard not to cross any line that will make us and others to respond aggressively directly against them. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Um, as a final question, uh, 
bit of prophecy. What do you, when we look towards the future and, and we look ahead, what do you see internally within Israel? Uh, you know, we saw there was a lot of division in Israeli society prior to October 7th, and you alluded to some um, protests and, and things going on even right now again. So my question is, as the situation with the hostages approaches six months um, and, you know, we're, we're, there's this desperation to get them out at any cost. You know, we've had people say to us here on this program, it doesn't have to be a good deal. It just has to be a deal. Get them out. Get them out. How do you feel that the Israeli population is, uh, where do they land on that? Do they agree a deal at any cost, even if it means not defeating Hamas, even if it means that an immediate ceasefire as they were demanding? What do you think, can you give us a pulse on what's happening in Israel, uh, what's happening in society in connection to this enormous, enormous, enormous issue and part of this war? Uh, we are living in a stage which we have the topics or the problem after October 7th, and we have many other problems that happened before October 7th. And those are much, much bigger. Those are much, much harder. So unfortunately, I cannot see the mechanism that fix that. So even if we fix the hostages issues, the tense among the Israeli society will remain. And as I said, I cannot see the mechanism that can fix it. And therefore, I'm very much concerned. Very much concerned. Any final thoughts for our viewers about what we can do here from America? We don't want to just be spectators with all of this that's happening in Israel with our soldiers risking it all. We want to feel that we are active and that we're doing something that makes a difference. What kind of final message would you leave for our audience? Uh, to make it simple, keep doing what you do. So far, you did a great job. So far, you show us that you support us. You show us the, not only the sympathy. Actually, uh, many leaders from the FIDF came to Israel, visit the site, spoke with the soldiers and show their love. Keep doing the same thing and, and we will fight and make sure that we are winning. Will do, no problem. Thank you so, so much, General. Thank you very much. Stay, stay safe. Honor. Thank you and you too. What an honor to have someone like Brigadier General Nitzan Noriel be with us and offer us a glimpse into the world of our brave IDF soldiers. Some of it was hard to hear, to hear, but it's important that we are living in the truth, that we're living in reality. As we sit here comfortable in our seats, we always must remember those who are standing guard, those who are sacrificing, those who are serving with unimaginable dedication and courage to protect our homeland and protect you and I, to protect Jews all over the world. They are the heartbeat of our people but their service does not come without sacrifice. So what can you do? Just as the general said, show them your love and appreciation. We cannot simply be spectators. With FIDF, you can be an active participant, a champion, a lifeline for our IDF soldiers. Your time and resources matter. They tell our soldiers that no matter what they hear in the media, that they have friends, that they have support, that they are cherished. So stay with us, make a difference. Am Yisrael Chai forever.